Hi everybody, Michelangelo Badio here. Sorry I'm about two minutes late. Why? Because Joey wanted to rule the show. He was listening to Everybody Wants to Rule the World and he said I should be ruling the world. So we were late. I had an argument with him saying this is my show, not his. But anyway, it's good to be back. It was uh, nice seeing everybody and nice starting everything again this year. I'm going to be on the road starting tomorrow, so I'll still be able to do the show from undisclosed locations. I'd like to say hi to a few people. Uh, these people I don't really even know. Devious Intention, hello. Uh, Roxana, Joel, I see Jenny out there. Uh, who else? Uh, people are starting to show up here. It's great. I want to talk today. Hi, Cynthia. How are you? Draco. That's a cool name. Um, anyway, what did I do? Okay, here I'm talking. Let's see. Who else? John Peter. Hello. Uh, Denny. Hi. Oh, okay. Denny's from Devious Intentions. I should know that. I knew I knew that name. Okay, anyway. Sorry. Joey's in the zone. See, Joey heard everybody wants to rule the world, but he wanted to change it to says Joey wants to rule the world and Joey rules the world and so I had to talk him talk to him anyway let's see uh Abraham that's a cool name how are you I wanted to talk because we had such great response on the last live stream and it is a topic that I know a little bit about I wanted to talk about more about playing fast now I I've been had a lot of time to to think about things, you know, even when I was going to school, I used to think about, you know, my future, you know, what would happen. I always dated tapes. For example, when I was growing up, the, the way we used to record was cassettes. And I have hundreds and hundreds of cassettes. But what I would do, uh, Rob Ross, my great friend, and our, you know, my brother from another mother, uh, you know, we look a lot alike, we dress alike, we even had the same shoes on the other day. What's going on? And so, but anyway, he's a great musician, you know, great drummer, he can play guitar, he can play bass, he can sing, uh, write songs. You know, he's just been a, a really close friend and, you know, he's like a brother to me. But the point is, is that back in the day, in the early days when, you know, we're the same age, so when we were in our early 20s in a band, I would put on a cassette and I would rec start recording and I would say, for example, September 8th, 1979 or 1980 or 1981. Let's say 81. September 16th, 1981 at 2.06 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon. It's a beautiful day. And I would describe the day. I would put the year and you could hear my voice like, hi, September 16th. And then I would play whatever I was going to play, you know, whether, whether it was singing or playing or playing and singing. And it is amazing because I've got, and cassettes, for whatever reason, the, the particles they put in, the actual tape that they used for a high quality cassette, not the cheap ones, but the Maxells, the, the name brands at the time. I used to use Maxell exclusively and they have really, really held up. It's kind of like a good brand of a guitar or an amp, but uh, the brand that I chose, I can still play these tapes and they sound great today, for real. And so, but it brings you right back there, it's so cool. And I used to think back then, about you know how I would be remembered as a musician and what I could do to make it and write down all these songs. I mean, even things like I would write down ideas. Like, well, that was Mark McNally, a great friend of mine that's a friend of Rob's too, that wrote that riff. But then I came up with it. The other parts to the song. So it was a true collaborative effort. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because I put a lot of thought into why speed kills and why the techniques that I have taught you over the years are still current and still viable. And there is a reason for this. 
One of the things that I learned very early on studying orchestral music, when I say, cla I don't like to say classical music because that can also be construed as the classic era. You know, there was the Renaissance, the Baroque, the classic, the Romantic, the Impressionist. So there were different eras of music. For example, Bach was a Baroque era. That's what we call him, composer. But Mozart was classical. Beethoven was the transition between the classical and romantic eras of music. So you can look at these in historical context. But what happened was when I studied piano and started doing these short exercises. It's one exercise. Fist in the air, yes, but this is, you can do it one of two ways, here or yeah. Now, getting back to this, one of the things that I learned is that when you do a short riff, a short exercise, and you isolate specifically on the pattern or the, and the technique that you want to use, this is how you can get faster. And one of the things that I realized too with modern playing, because you know, there's a million guitar players out there saying they have the way to play fast or they can, and look at there, there's so many great musicians. I think probably the young generation of guitarists today is probably the best that's ever been. And I'm not saying that lightheartedly, I truly believe this. But I also think this, speed kills work so well because these are shorter exercises isolated for a specific technique. Because once you get into these longer exercises, you are getting into the writing of the person teaching it. So if I said this, here's my exercise for alternate picking. Which I did. Paul Gilbert did it, and everybody called it the Paul Gilbert riff. Oh, yeah. Oh. And so Joey was like, what? And I was like, what? But, you know, it helped people, so I understand. But when you do a short riff like that, that's all you need to actually master the art of alternate picking. Just to be able, what is alternate picking? Three notes per string. Down, up, down. So if you're going to go to a new string... Do you pick down or up? Down, up, down, up. So all you have to work on is an exercise that shows an up pick on a new string with three notes per string. So I isolated this and did a short exercise. And this is something that was unique to me because in guitar playing before this, you either learn songs, even Mel Bay, he didn't, he didn't, you know, Mel Bay, the book that, that sold a gazillion copies, they didn't go, they didn't do short exercises. He had songs. You know, it might be a simple song, you know. I'm just making that up. But it was a song. It wasn't an exercise that was short and specific like classical keyboards were shown. And so, and I realized that even today, you can't get a shorter exercise than that. Or how about for economy picking? And so you've got the short, thanks, Denny. I appreciate that. And I, I truly want to help. Uh, Denny wrote, the reason young guitarists are so good is because they had guitar li gods like you to teach and inspire them. Well, I'm grateful for that, and, and I truly do want to help. And I also, I'm an analytical person, so especially now with all the things I'm doing, I'm busier now in my career than I've ever been in my entire life. And that's unusual in itself when you've had a, a long career like mine, and it's going better than ever, and I'm very grateful for it. But I realized 
that to help you, I have to understand exactly what I'm talking about. And one of the things that's really come to light when I'm watching, I was watching other teachers and other lessons and, you know, a lot of people say, well, my method's this way and to get faster, you can do this. And I look at, there, if you're a great guitar player and you're out there teaching, that's the most noble thing you can do. So I'm, I'm all for it. But what I realized is this, you can't really beat speed kills on this uh, topic because I have reduced these exercises to the bare essentials, to the, the exact, I, it's a laser beam on the technique you want to learn. If you want to learn alternate picking, you don't have to learn a song. You don't have to learn a song. You learn a technique. Those are all short riffs that I strung together. This is what I learned. Once you get into these longer riffs, for example, I'm going to do this. Six notes. About as short as you can versus that. I've got two notes per string. You know, for, for pentatonics, and that's a great technique to you. But when you get three notes per string, six notes is about what you can do. Or even that. Six notes is about the minimum that I do for an exercise. So once you get more than six, you're making it up as you go along. You're saying, okay, well, here's, here's my way to play faster. So it's really become subjective. So what you're doing is you're, you're showing your way of taking this and expounding upon it, making it bigger, making it not better, but making it more. And that's why Speed Kill still is so relevant because I stripped it all away. On my first instructional video, the Starlix video, the first shred video ever, a guy man dude who was a great friend of mine at the time and you know, we parted ways. Uh, he was my rhythm guitar player, a great musician. And, uh, but he kept telling me on my first video, Mike, make sure you make the exercises really long. So, you know, exercise. Long. Oh, wait, there's more. And I did it like that. I had these monster long exercises. And then I realized that's not the way I learned how to play. That's not the way I learned how to play piano. That's not the way I felt. And the video did extremely well. I mean, it was our bestseller for two years. So I did something right, but that's because I could play that good. I, I worked so hard on that video. I even transcribed the booklet myself. Uh, there were no tablature programs back then, no software. I had to do it by hand. But I realized with Speed Kills, I, I could do it the way I learned and the way, and that's why Speed Kills has eclipsed my original video because it just cuts, and I'll, I'll use the phrase again, like a laser beam right to the essence of it. And so more about playing fast is specifically this. Um, great memory of mine and fingers. Thank you. What it, what the uh, slide of uh, diamond? That's yeah, great, right? Uh, paint it black. He heard my version of paint it black. There's a, a thing in music called color pointillism, like so, like I've seen a red door uh, now. So what we used to do is color pointillism is this. It's a, a theoretic. It's a music theory term. Each note. Each note is assigned an instrument. So if you go, you can have a bassoon playing bum, 
You can have a French horn going down. You can have a flute going bum, a violin. And so what we did is we took voices. I was in a band with Rob Ross at the time. And so we had, and it's like, and we had four singers. Rob could sing. I was the main lead singer. Our bass player was the main lead singer. And our other guitar player, Mark McNally, who would also sing too. He had a really good voice. So we went. Each person took a note. I've seen a red door and, and we went like, I've seen a red door and I want it painted black. And so each one of us took a point or a melodic note. So Rob sang, I've, and then Mark, our bass player, and me, then Mark, and then we started all over again. So it was like, and that is color pointillism. In other words, each point or each note has a different color, meaning the color is the the instrument, the timber, the sound. And so I, I played that for a guy where like, I've seen a red door and I was bad. And you hear like, it sounds so bizarre to hear it because, but it's melodic because the melody is there, but each of us just only took a note of it. And then black, somebody had to do both. You can't go black, well we could have, but it would have sounded stupid in our humble opinions back then. But anyway, guy heard it and he did a version of itself, uh, of him. Now, I want to talk a little bit about more about playing fast. Adam, can you hit 185, the beginning? I use a metronome and drum software almost exclusively to warm up. Hit it. Contrapuntal music. I'm going to answer the questions. Contrapuntal is a longer word for counterpoint. So when you have, for example, if I went, and so then you have, for example, Bach's uh, two part invention in D minor. Here's counterpoint. You go like this. Now one voice goes simultaneously as the other one goes. It's like that's counterpoint. Or if I go like this. It's a bass and a, and a rhythm. It's a bass and a lead going together. But true counterpoint is what Bach did. Uh, when you when you play a melody, that's Bach's D minor invention. It's number four. And uh, what what he does is he starts a melody and then counterpoint, meaning. Point again, it's like color pointillism. Counterpoint the, the points of notes, meaning notes, are countering what the melody is. So you have simultaneous melodies at meaning at the same time. You can get up to box fugues had up to four and more parts at the same time. There's uh, I don't remember which uh, opera it is with Mozart, he he depicted a crowd scene and there were over 17 different parts going on at the same time to depict a, a crowd. That is counterpoint. I studied counterpoint in school and uh, uh, it was under a class called Form and Analysis and I wrote a bunch of counterpoint songs like do 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 then but then the second voice comes in do 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 and the the voice if you listen to my song pray on pray Hard counterpoint, I went like that. It's really a 
really out there, chromatic, beautiful melody. And then I had another voice in counterpoint playing. The song is called Pray On, Pray. Pray like and pray on, pray like the eagle is coming down, swooping down at the mouse. It's like the last act of defiance when you see the mouse flipping off the hawk that's about to get him or her. And uh, But it's pray on, pray, like praise history. But when you hear this, it's two voices in counterpoint. In other words, the points of notes are countering each other and creating a nice harmony along with it. So that's what it is. Uh, spastic ink. I have no idea who that is. Uh, anyway, counterpoint is a uh, tempo. Lots of love, bloody. Uh, I don't know what that is. Anyway, so much. So that's that. Randy Rhodes did a lot of counterpoint. I'm not sure which specific songs. I'd have to hear that. But when put it this one, when you have two melodies going on at the same time, and they create a nice pleasing harmony, and they sound good. Now uh, you've got counterpoint. So anyway, getting back to the playing fast, what I've learned is simply this. Play these fast riffs. Adam, can you hit 185 again? I'll show you. Just that. Now that's alternate picking. Keep, keep, keep it going. take one basic riff, change it around a little bit, and just keep playing. All I need to do is focus on this one riff. What is playing long extended riffs, especially on guitar? It is taking a short pattern and extending it. So instead of going like I'm now I'm playing diatonic. I can do a shorter riff. Adam, hit 185 again. Now it's just pretty slow. I did there was just combine a couple things and see that's the key you take these short riffs and you combine them together but you have to practice it and what I would recommend more about playing fast is this get speed kills or just watch me here take these short short exercises and go over them and over them until you can't stand it anymore then do it again and use drum software. We don't need the days of going <laughs> are gone. I found that it's more inspiring to use a drum program. I have a real simple one. I use it for all different tempos. And I also, I was talking about this before. I love to practice. 
I'll put it on 185 again. Just something like this. drum program it inspires you to do a lot so what did I just do there I was working on a tremolo I've talked about this since the 80s I'm really good at it why because I practice it Joey practice it Robert practiced it we practice it it's the triangle the head the hand the hand and so once you sync these three so what do you do when you get that I'm not really concerned about with my with my fretboard hand, I just and so when you do this and you use a quantized, when I say quantized, what this means is exact, like disco. Why do you think disco became so big? It was the first time in human history that drum machines were electronic. So you have, you know. Notes per string down, up, down. This is so cool. Okay, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm looking at uh, some comments here. Do, I, do you believe new music is on the horizon? Is it wrong to embrace the new? Never wrong to embrace the new. Um, the new, my motto, Cynthia asked this question, is it wrong to embrace the new? I have a motto, always a student. I am living proof right here, right now, that what I've said all these years works. But... I've also learned one thing. What See, going to school gave me the ability to learn. I, I never said I was the smartest guy in my class. I never said that mus having a degree in music made me a better musician. In fact, I've said the opposite, that it didn't make me a better musician. But it gave, but going to school and finishing did two things when I finished. So it says I finished something I started, one. Two, it gave me the ability to learn. My motto is always a student. Once you start thinking you're so good that you can't learn anything new, then you become just like, oh, back in the old days, it was so much better. Well, yeah, it was pretty great in the old days. I mean, when you think about it, you know, I mean, Charlie Christian was in the old days. Led Zeppelin was in the old days. The Beatles, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Shostakovich. You know, Jascan Dupre, the Renaissance uh, composer. So, you know, yeah, the old days were pretty cool. But what it enables me to do is to always learn. So, Cynthia, to answer your question, this is why music is so good today, why young people are so good at it. You understand that there are people that came before you, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Learn what they learned, okay? Take it from there and then embrace the new it's your job to take what you know and make it your own and make something new. Nobody, no, there's no handcuffs on this latest generation that says you have to play like Jimmy Page. But this newest generation knows about Jimmy Page that plays guitar. They know about Joe Pass. They know about Django Reinhardt. These musicians are revered because they were great. Every era is, has great players. Music that is great in the year 1722 will still be great in the year 2087. It's just, and I'm making these numbers up, but the point is great is great in any generation. Looks change, styles change, 
but great is great. A great rock song is still a great rock song. Great music is great. Just like the techniques, Joe Pass could rip on a guitar. Pat Martino, early George Benson, Al Di Miola. So the young musicians can take what is already there, like me. You, you know, there's many people born half a generation after I released my instructional videos. You take these and learn and then take it upon yourself to take the new. It's the, it's, yeah, and somebody just wrote, Matthew said it, said it. Great music has no expiration date, and that's very true. Looks have an expiration date. When I look at myself in the 80s, I'm like, I used to be so cool. What happened? I mean, I, I saw pictures of me when I, in my early 20s when I was going to school. I had really short hair, so and I have these ears that stick out, okay, which is why I can hear pretty good. So my ears are like, you know, they probably would move. Uh, you know, I, my ears stick out. My uncle had this too. Thank God, long hair is in style. But anyway, so I had hair about this long. I grew a mustache. I used to think I was so handsome and cool. Today I look and I go, dude, what was I thinking? It was like bad Freddie Mercury. And, you know, I looked like some bizarre terrorist or something. But I back then I was like, yeah, I'm cool, bro. You know, I feel like Magnum P.I., dude, yeah. And, and, you know, I felt like, oh, yes, I'm a young Tom Selleck. But the point is the looks change. So, but, you know, so we could look at Johann Sebastian Bach's clothes or Beethoven's clothes. In fact, Beethoven probably would have looked at Bach well, well, Bach was considered passe in his own time. I don't know if many of you know this, but he was, his music was dead up until almost a century after he died. He was not known in his own lifetime, and he was not known for a century until a century later. His music was rediscovered, and the genius of Bach finally was shown to the world a hundred plus years after he died. Now, if you look at Beethoven, who was after that in the classic era, the transition to the Romantic, he would probably look at box clothes and say, what does this do? You know, that's not cool. And the point is this, that, you know, is Motley cruel? Well, some bands, like, I got to admit, Robert Plant still looks cool today. So does Elvis. So, you know, there's a lot of people that look cool back in the day that still look cool, but there are a lot that don't. You know, you look at the style and go, what was I thinking? But if you close your eyes and listen to the music, the music is doesn't change. There's no expiration date on the music. Styles come and go. Hairstyles, facial styles, people with guys with beards, girls with beards now. You know, it's you know, the styles come and go, but great music, you just close your eyes and it puts you right back where it's supposed to. So anyway, um, I hope I've said this thing about speed. It's can be acquired and it can be improved. Short exercises. And look, at there are so many great teachers out. The, see, I, I'm not a big proponent of saying, well, my version, oh, back in the old days, because I've seen this. I've seen some teachers, you know, saying, well, that's the old technique. Sorry, dude. Paganini is several centuries before he still got technique that uh, it takes a true virtu virtuoso to play what he played. So unless human fingers, unless we grow another finger or we do something completely different than, you know, if you put my hand up to somebody from the 1800s, yeah, I'm a tall person. I'm 183 centimeters, six feet tall. But there were people that big back then. And there were people, even if you have a smaller hand, you have to look at your index finger. I have an index finger that's smaller than my ring finger. Many people do. A lot of people have index fingers that are longer than your ring finger. So even if you say, oh, I have a little hand, but you've got a long index finger, you can stretch. And the point is this, big hand, small hand, thin hand, fat hand. Sean Lane was a big guy. Michael Romeo's a big guy. They are two fantastic guitar players that can shred, that can just, you know, Sean Lane, Rest in peace, he was amazing, I jammed with him. Michael Romeo, I don't know him real well, but we're friendly with each other. He's an amazing guitarist. So the size of your hand, the thickness of your fingers, a lot of that hasn't changed in centuries. Yeah, there's few differences, but that's why these exercises work so well. It's the, what we do today 
you know, it takes a virtuoso to play Rachmaninoff. It takes a virtuoso to play Paganini the way it's supposed to be played and the speed in which it's played. So you can't just say, well, these old techniques, which is why I don't really care for that. I'm not going to criticize anybody, but it's why Speed Kills works. Work on speed with drum software. Do short bursts. Just go do 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 Stop your hand, then then move it up five BPM. Then move it up five more. There are no set ways other than you work on these exercises over and over and over. And you can vary the workouts. You know, I talk about this all the time. Bodybuilders talk about this. If you do the same, if you do the same workout every time, I've been to the gym seven times on the last seven days. If I went to the gym every day and did a half an hour of cardio, say the treadmill, then I start on biceps, four, at four sets, 15 to 20 reps. Then I move and I do circuit training a lot because I'm, I'm never home long enough to do a whole program. So then, and circuit training means, you know, all the body parts. So then I'll switch to quads. If I did the same order, the same way every day, the gains would be minimal because your body gets used to this routine. So the, the idea, even Arnold Schwarzenegger used to say this, you mix it up. You shock your body. You focus on the muscle you want to work on, just like the technique. You focus on this alternate picking, alternate picking. Uh, you kind of... <laughs> on all these different things but one at a time and when people say well should I start on speed kills two before one it doesn't matter what matters is you focus on each technique you don't have to do it the same way every day the only thing I do do every day is that warm-up exercise that I showed a couple weeks ago where I had the that it calibrates my mind and both hands. Joey and Robert and my brain that tells them what to do gets focused on these warm-ups. So I, and it's like stretching before, or like if you're an athlete and, you know, you warm up and stretch out before the game. You always want to do that. But once that initial exercise and the initial warm-ups with these specific exercises are done, then it's carte blanche. Then you do what you want. So I hope this helps. Uh, helps. Does Joey ever sleep? He does. But see, he likes to work while I'm sleeping. It'll be like, I'm the boss. It's me. I, I, me, me. Who do you want to see? Joey. Shut up. No. Joey's never shut up. He always wants to shred. Speaking of shredding, I haven't talked much about Sawtooth today because I think, one, the guitar is amazing. Two, I talk about them all the time. I think they're great. I wouldn't be playing them. I play them everywhere, 100%. And uh, we have some new songs from the Michelangelo Badio Band that are going to be coming out. And also, I'm doing a show with Vinnie Apice, who's the iconic drummer that his first job professionally big one was John Lennon and then uh, he played in Black Sabbath and Ronnie James Dio so when when you hear Rainbow in the Dark and all those iconic Dio songs you're listening to Vinnie Apice so anyway and he was with Black Sabbath so he was with Ronnie James Dio with Sabbath and his solo career and so the Dio the band Dio so the reason I'm saying this is May 31st which is a Friday at the historic Viper Room in Hollywood the MAB band featuring me on guitar, Nils Lawrence, a great bass player, singer. He's got a great look. Joe Fuco, uh, one of the main owners of Sawtooth. He's a great drummer, a great grooving drummer. And we are the core band. We're going to be playing with Vinnie Apice's Sabbath Nights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S, where Vinny uh, goes through his discography and the history of his time with Black Sabbath. I've sold out every show at the Viper Room, uh, more, we, and they oversell it because there's opening acts. I'm just telling you, May 31st, Friday, get your tickets soon. It's the, this is going to be a super event. Having Vinny there, having me there, 
Uh, and and it's we like I said, every other time I've played there, it's been sold out to the max. This one's going to be no different. And I can't wait to play with Vinny. He's a really great person. His brother Carmine's amazing too. I know them both very well. Uh, Vinny is an iconic drummer, and he's one of the greatest human beings you could ever meet. But anyway, so that's some stuff that's going on with Sawtooth. I've talked about Metal Method. Learn-2-shred.com. Sawtooth has some new guitars uh, coming out. This is part of the MAB Signature Series. We have a new double guitar that's coming out this year that's really pointed and cool. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff. You know, I'm really grateful to each and every one of you that has has followed me and has helped me perpetuate the career. But I can say this unequivocally. The things that I tell you when I talk about guitar, I have a motto too. One, always a student. Two, I know my lane. One of the things that enabled me to be so successful is that I found other people to do jobs I couldn't do, that can do their job way better. Um, am I doing my own video today? No! Adam there is sitting there. He's a super close friend of mine. And, you know, we've been friends forever. He was my student. He's a great guitarist. But he's operating the video. Why? I can play two guitars at the same time. But if I could figure out how to operate a camera standing there, play guitar standing here, I would do it. But you can't. And so I know my lane. My lane is guitar. My lane is guitar. It's writing guitar music. It's writing music. It's performing music. And it's also being a great teacher because what I teach you, I practice myself and I am not a judge and I'm not a jury and I never tell anybody that there, I have no prejudice against anything when it comes to guitar techniques, any styles. It doesn't matter what style you want to play. If you're going to alternate pick, I don't care if you're playing bluegrass, jazz, shred, or name the blues, it doesn't matter. The technique is the same, and that's what I taught, and I teach, technique. What you do with it is entirely up to you. So anyway, I want to thank each and every one of you. I'm Michelangelo Badio. I'll be back next week from an undisclosed location. See ya.